starting to feel a little bit like Easter today? <laughs> Hopefully, right? Uh, definitely, when we sing songs that are related to Jesus' resurrection, it kind of gets us into the mood of things. And if you were with us over in the dome for our breakfast, we got to sing some of those Easter resurrection songs over there as well. And so I want to thank Joe and Joyce for leading us in that time this morning as well. And I want to thank Nathaniel for sharing uh, in our communion meditation today, kind of doing things a little differently today, mixing things up a little bit. But to get us started this morning, I kind of need your help, right? Uh, And so especially with this being Easter morning, what I want to do is I'm going to say Christ is risen, and here's what I need you to do. With all the Easter enthusiasm that you can muster up, you need to say, He is risen indeed, okay? Are you ready for it? All right, so I want you to say it really loud. Okay, here we go. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Okay, one more time really loud. We want the neighbors that, you know, across the yard, we want them to know it's Easter too. Okay, so let's do it one more time. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Indeed he has. You know, today is an, an awesome day that we get to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. He is alive and death could not hold him down. And this is our hope, right? Regardless of whatever situation that you are in in your life. That he's, you know, one of many different ways, right? You just get to pick one. No, you didn't say. He said he's the way, the truth, and the life. And in our world today, we struggle with that because that sounds really exclusive, doesn't it? sounds really exclusive and and it is exclusive right because jesus is the only one who exclusively went to the cross and died for our sins he's the only one who exclusively walked out of the grave for you and i to be able to have hope this morning so yeah it is exclusive right there's only one way you can get into the kingdom of god and that is through jesus christ and so that is what we're talking about today actually we've been in a series that has been leading up to today Um, a series that we call Who is Jesus? And we've been kind of wrestling with this idea of who Jesus is. And uh, some of you I know have been part of that. And today we are actually going to be taking a look at a conversation that Jesus has with this guy by the name of Nicodemus. So if you have your Bibles, if you have them on your phone, or you want to grab a Bible underneath the chair, you can do so. We're going to be turning to John chapter 3, verse 1. I'm also going to have the scripture up here on the screen, too, for for those of us who would rather look up here than than to look on your phone. But as we go through this, what we're going to see is that Jesus is going to tell Nicodemus how to have a fresh start, right? A new beginning. So let me ask you real quick this morning. How many of you could use a fresh start this morning, right? Right, a new beginning, right? Here's the thing. I don't think, think Nicodemus even knew that he needed a fresh start. Do you know why? Because he had, you know, a pretty well accomplished life, right? Like many of us do in this room. We have a well, I mean, Nicodemus drove a a pretty nice camel, right? He worked a pretty nice job. Um, And the dude had it all together, looking at him from the outside in. And yet Jesus sees something that is missing in his life. Jesus sees past the exterior that oftentimes we put up in our lives, and Jesus sees Nicodemus' heart. And let me just say this before we jump into this passage today in John chapter 3. Jesus sees your heart as well. He sees what's going on in your life right now. All the struggles and the hardships and the things that you're dealing with today, he sees it. He knows what is going on in your life. And I think that's really important for us, especially as we jump into this passage of Scripture, because this is a truth that we really need to hear before we really tune into what Jesus is going to have this conversation with Nicodemus. Because this kind of presets the passage, is that Jesus knows what's going on in your life and in your heart. So let's jump right into it. John chapter 3, verse 1, this is what it says. It says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish council. And uh, Nicodemus was, was a religious leader. He was a Pharisee. 
And he was, he was a part of the Sanhedrin. And for him to be a part of the Sanhedrin, it means that he had reached the top, right? He had kind of walked up through all the steps in the ladder, and he had reached the top. He couldn't get any higher, right? Because back in Jesus' day, there would have been somewhere around five to 6,000 Pharisees, right? And there's only 70 seats in the Sanhedrin. So for you to occupy one of the 70 seats in the Sanhedrin, that meant that you had arrived, right? You had made it to the top. Look at verse 2. What he says here, he says, He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And I find it interesting that we see here in this passage that um, he comes to Jesus at night, right, while it's dark. Now, way back when, when I used to preach a lot, when I was a lot younger, I always thought that he came to Jesus at night because he didn't want to be seen with Jesus, right? Because he was a religious leader. But the more I've thought about this is actually that there was people with Jesus all the time. Right? Everywhere Jesus went, he had people around. So the reason why Nicodemus comes at night, and I believe this, is that he came to him to have a personal and private conversation. Meaning that if you could have a conversation with Jesus, right, what would be the questions that you would want to ask him? What would be the thoughts that would be in your head? And Nicodemus had those same questions and those same kind of thoughts in his head, and he wanted to talk to Jesus, right? And so he comes to Jesus at a time there wouldn't be any interruptions, right? There wouldn't be other people around him, and so he comes to him. And as he comes to Jesus, he calls him Rabbi, which is really a, a name that you know offers respect to Jesus, but you and I both know that Jesus was much more than just a rabbi. And then he says to him, we know, right? He says, we know. Now, who's the we that he's talking about? Well, he's probably talking about some of the Sanhedrin, probably not all of the Sanhedrin, but at least a few that are in the Sanhedrin, right? That they know that he comes from God based off of his teaching and based off of his miracles, right? Those two things show that there's signs that Jesus is either come from God, or God is working in his life, or God's doing something in Jesus' life. And so Nicodemus comes to Jesus with these thoughts and these questions. And I, I find it interesting that Jesus doesn't acknowledge a single thing that Nicodemus says, right? I mean, he doesn't, it's like Nicodemus has all these questions and, and uh, concerns and all these ideas of who Jesus is, and, and Jesus doesn't even acknowledge any of that. In fact, take a look at what it says in verse 3. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. I mean, that, that comes out of like left field, right? I mean, some of you may be familiar with this story, so you just kind of anticipate Jesus saying this, but, but this is like, Jesus is totally domineering the conversation, right? He is taking complete control yeah, maybe Nicodemus had all these questions and thoughts, but Jesus wasn't going to let him share them in any way, shape, or form. And that probably, I'll just be honest with you, that probably frustrated Nicodemus. I mean, could you imagine, right? You sitting down with Jesus, you have all these questions, you have all these thoughts, and then all of a sudden Jesus says something that you weren't expecting him to say. Jesus takes control of the conversation. You don't get to ask your questions. You don't get to share your, thing, your thoughts. It's the same situation with Nicodemus. And notice he didn't say, enter the kingdom of God. He says, see the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus is saying, way before you can actually even enter the kingdom of God, you need to be able to see, or in some ways we could even say, sense the kingdom of God working in your life, right before you can even enter into it. Well, Nicodemus is confused about Jesus talking about being born again. And so in verse 4, we read, it says, this is Nicodemus talking. He says, how can someone be born when they are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. So Jesus knows, right? Jesus knows what's happening in Nicodemus' heart, right? He knows what concerns that he has, and he knows where his position is with God. And so he looks at Nicodemus in verse 5, and he says this, says, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. He continues in verse 7. 
says, You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. What we see in this passage is, is that, in other words, Jesus is talking about when somebody becomes a Christian, right? When somebody is born again, it's almost like a miraculous thing. And here's why it's so miraculous, because it's the Holy Spirit working in their life. Jesus is saying that a spiritual rebirth is where God's Spirit is working in you and working in me, right? And it's almost as if God is chasing you down. You know that there's things in your life that, that God wants to change, that God wants to do differently, and, and the Holy Spirit is nudging you, right? The Holy Spirit is kind of prompting you to tell you that there's some things that are wrong, that there's things that aren't right in your life. In other words, we also know that the Holy Spirit, we, we have this word called conviction, right? The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. The Holy Spirit points us back to God and, and back to God's word, right? And so all these things are going on, and, and, and you know it because the Holy Spirit's trying to work inside of your heart, but people outside of you, they don't know it. They can't see it. Right? That's what Jesus is talking about. It's like the wind and the water, and he's, he's referencing this. You hear the sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. That's the Spirit of God working in each other. And let me just say this this morning, that God is working in your life right now, and I hope that you can sense it. Right? I hope that you can see that God is wanting to do things in your heart and in your life right now, today. And it's so important because Jesus uses these metaphors of wind and water to describe what it means to become a Christian. And let me just say this, a new beginning or, or a fresh start that we all, you know, are looking for in our lives, it comes back to this idea of a spiritual birth, right? It requires a spiritual birth. Now, here's the thing. I think we all, at different times in our lives, we want a new beginning. We want a fresh start. The problem is, is that we want it on our own terms, Right? We kind of want to call the shots. We kind of want to be the ones in control, right? And so we'll say things like this. We'll say things, you know what, I'm, it's on my turn, so I'm just going to work a little harder at being better, right? I'm going to work a little harder at attending church more. I'm going to work a little harder at, you know, reading my Bible more. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to be the best version of me that I can possibly be. I'm going to turn over a new leaf, right? I'm going to achieve all of the goals. And we do that instead of what? Instead of surrendering to God. Instead of letting go of our lives and letting God be the one who leads us and guides us. Instead of letting God have complete control of us. And you know what? There's any, not anything wrong with doing any of those things. But, but if Jesus was here, he would say this. He would say that it won't stick. It won't stick. You know why? Because the kind of change that God wants to do in our lives requires requires a spiritual birth to be born again right he describes this as the miraculous thing that takes place in our lives that only god can do in your life so the gospel message is for anyone and everyone and there is no one who is too far from god there is no one who is too sinful or too dark or too lost or or too addicted right the gospel is for everyone and now Nicodemus, you know, Jesus really hasn't fixed his confusion at all. In fact, anything, Jesus has added to his confusion. And we read this in verse 9. This is what it says. It says, Nicodemus asks, he says, how can this be? Now, Nicodemus asks this question, and then Jesus turns around and points the finger right back at him. He says, you are Israel's teacher, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. He continues in verse 12. He says, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. He's talking about himself. Verse 14, an important verse. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, 
that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. You know, verse 14 in this passage, Jesus is really trying to help Nicodemus kind of understand what he's trying to teach about this idea of being born again. And so he references um, somewhat of a, like an obscure passage of Scripture from the Old Testament out of Numbers chapter 21, in which um, the story goes that the Israelites were grumbling against Moses, their leader. You ever grumble against your leader? <laughs> Whether it's your governor or, you know, it's your president or maybe it's your boss or, right, whoever it is that's your leader in your life, we have a tendency to grumble. And that's what the Israelites were doing. They were grumbling against Moses. And so God sends some venomous snakes, venomous serpents, right, into their assembly to bite them. And not only did, were, did they get bitten by these venomous snakes, but they were dying from it, right? That's, that's what snakes do. They get your attention, right, when they come into your midst, especially if they bite you. And so they go to Moses, and they're like, Moses, what do we do, right? And so Moses, out of his compassion for his people, he goes to God and saying, God, they, these people are really, really, really sorry. And so this is how God replies in verse 8 of Numbers chapter 21. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole, and anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. Now, I love that, because all you have to do is look at it and live. That's what, that's what Jesus is referring to, this idea of understanding what it means to be born in. You know what he didn't say? He didn't say, hey, if you would just take this quiz, take this test, and if you pass, then you can live, right? Or if you just make five easy payments of $19.95 at the end of it, you will live. No, he didn't say it. He said, all you have to do is look at me and live. And you know what? Not everybody did. And people continued to die because they wouldn't obey God. They wouldn't look at it. And so Jesus is saying this as a reference to the foreshadowing of him going to the cross and being lifted up. And he, all you have to do is to look to Jesus, right? All you have to do is to believe what Jesus came to do for you, that he was crucified for your sins. You know, this last Friday, uh, we had the opportunity to celebrate Good Friday service. And um, every red mark on this cross is a mark of one person that left their mark on the cross. Every red mark represents something. You know what it represents? Sin. Right? Each one of us put Jesus on the cross and this red mark represents our sin that Jesus bore on the cross for us. See, when Jesus was lifted up, just like the snake in the wilderness that, that um, Moses is talking about here, that we are called to look upon Jesus. We are called not just to look upon him. I wish it was that easy that we could just look at Jesus and, and be good with that, but we are to believe that he died for each and every one of our sins. Here's the problem with this. Now, let me remind you that Jesus is talking to a very religious man, Nicodemus. And in this room today, we have some very religious people, right? We have some people who are followers of Jesus, and we have some people who know the Bible really well. The problem is, is that when our heads are so full of the Bible, and our heads are so full of doctrine, sometimes our hearts can be miles from Jesus. That was the problem with Nicodemus. And maybe for some of us in this room, that's a problem for us. We don't recognize it. We don't realize that we need a fresh start, that we need a new beginning. And so Jesus comes to Nicodemus, and rightly, he is, you could call him a pastor, right? Because that's who he was. He was a religious leader of the people of Israel. You could call Nicodemus a pastor. This was somebody who was the religious elite, right? This is somebody who was morally upright. And if there ever could have been somebody who could earn salvation on their own, it would be somebody like Nicodemus. But Jesus knows his heart. And he knows that that is not enough. That you've got to be born again. You've got to give your life to Christ. 
This passage shows us that for each and every one of us in this room this morning, that there's no amount of Bible knowledge, no amount of church attendance, no amount of moral performance, no amount of religious activity, no amount of good behavior is good enough for God. We fall short, right? We are sinners in need of a Savior. And there isn't a single one of us that's going to make it, by the way. Not a single one of us. And because of the fact that our disobedience and our sin has left us in a place called death, right? That we are spiritually dead. And so when Jesus says, hey, do you want a new beginning? Do you want a fresh start? You know what he's really saying? He's saying you're spiritually dead and you need life. You need life, and I'm here to bring that life. You see, the gospel is not about making good people better, but about bringing dead people to life. Oftentimes, we think of just coming to church because that's what good people do. And because that's what we think of church, that's why it keeps some people out of church, because it's only the good people that come to church, and the bad people, well, we don't want the bad people to come to church, right? Because church is only for good people. And what Jesus is saying here, no, this, this idea of what he did on the cross is for us to bring dead people back to life. We are dead people that need life. We're not people who are trying to get better at life. We are dead. You can't can't get better when you're dead. Jesus brings to us life. He already knows what's in Nicodemus' heart. And let me just say this this morning. He knows what's in your heart as well. So let me ask you this question. How do you experience a new birth? Well, I think you have to take off your jacket, so to speak. Right? You have to stop pretending and stop hiding. You know, this suit coat that I'm wearing today, I know it's Easter and some of us like to dress up for Easter, but this actually isn't a very accurate representation of who I am. In fact, I feel uh, really uncomfortable wearing this jacket today, to be honest with you. If I could take it off, this would be the real Mike. This would be the real me. Because just like Nicodemus, who wore priestly robes, sometimes we fail to see that as we walk into a church building, We hide what the real you is behind, don't we? If I was to be totally honest and transparent with you this morning, this is the real me. It's not a sermon illustration. You know, it's a mirror. And the truth of it is, is I struggle with three major sins in my life. The first one is pride. You see, I oftentimes believe that I am something more than what I really am. And because of that's what pride does, it it boosts you up. It makes you feel like you're more important or more special than somebody else. And when you believe that, you know, actually what you're believing is a lie. And then to try to keep your pride in its right place, you have to struggle with the idea of trying to make people happy, right? You have to struggle with the idea of I'm here to, to give you what you want. I'm here to provide for you. And so what we end up doing is we end up feeding this thing called fear, Because we know that we'll never measure up. We know that we'll never be able to be who we really want to be. And so you know what we continue to do? We continue to lie. This is the real me. This is what I have to struggle with. And I'll be honest with you, every time I get up on the stage, every time I get in front of people, I feel like I'm a fake. Can you imagine that? 52 weeks out of the year that you have to get up in front of people every week and talk about how you want them to grow in God and you yourself maybe aren't growing in God the way that you should be either. You know what we call that in the church? We call that hypocrisy. That's what we call in the church, right? And if your leader is a hypocrite, then I wonder what the followers of that leader are. See, the truth of it is is that we're all hypocrites. We're all pretending to be somebody that we are really not. Do you know why? It's because we're dead, We're spiritually dead and we're looking for life. And so, you know what? I'm going to try to find life in my pride. I'm going to try to find life in my fear. I'm going to try to find life in my my life. See, this is the whole idea that we need to have a new start and a fresh beginning in our life. 
the truth of it is, is that I want to see us as a church to be a place where we remove our jacket. This is a great representation of removing our jacket, isn't it? Where we came up forward on Friday night and each one of us took our finger and we dipped it in the paint and we put it on the cross and we knew that it was our mark that we were leaving on the cross. We knew that it was our sin that put Jesus on the cross. See, if we pretend to be somebody other than that, we're lying to ourselves and we're believing lies. The truth of it is, is for each and every one of us, we have to come clean. We got to stop hiding behind the jacket. We got to stop pretending to be somebody that we are not. So the Bible talks about this. What does the Bible say? Well, the very next verse in this passage in John chapter 3 is probably a very famous verse, and you've probably heard it many times. But it's John 3, 16. And Jesus says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin? Your sin. Not just my sin, but your sin. Do you believe he personally, when he was nailed to the cross, that he saw you? 2,000 years into the future, he saw you and it was his life that laid down instead of you having to be willing to go to the cross. Jesus took the cross for you and he died for you. And the the first step in us understanding what it means to have, uh, to be born again, to have this new life is first we believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin. The second step is where we confess. And you know what confession is? Quite simply, just taking off the jacket. And revealing the real you. It's where you stop hiding. And you stop pretending to be somebody that you know deep down inside you're not. That you realize that you are dead. And without Jesus you will never have life. You will never have this place in the kingdom of God that Jesus is teaching Nicodemus about. And so we we let go of the jacket. And we come clean before God. That's what confession is. That's the second step. Believing, confessing, and the third step is repentance. That means we stop living for ourselves. We stop living with our own agenda of things we want to do and accomplish in life. And we start living for Jesus. Right? We look at how Jesus wants us to live. And you might be asking, well, well, how am I supposed to live for Jesus, I don't even know how to, how to do that. We, we start reading the Bible. We turn to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we read the teachings of Jesus to help us understand how Jesus would handle specific situations in our lives and how we would respond to it. So we become a student of the Word, and we get in the Bible and we read the Bible. That's how we learn to follow Jesus. And we have to let go of ourselves. See, the whole idea here is dying to self in order for Jesus to live in me and through me. And the fourth and last thing, we have belief, we have confession, we have repentance. And the last thing is baptism. And baptism is probably the most tangible and understandable expression of our commitment to Jesus. Right? Yet we struggle with it so much. But here's the truth of it. You can't have resurrection without a death. And baptism symbolizes both. Both a death and a resurrection. And it teaches us that we need to learn to die to ourselves. I love what Romans chapter 6 says about, about baptism. It says this, And don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Verse 4 We were therefore buried with him through baptism. I'm going to stop right there. We have a baptistry right back here. It's kind of hard for you to see. But this is a baptistry that is about four feet deep. Okay? And we fill it up with water. And when we do a baptism, this is an expression of what Jesus went through for us. Meaning that Jesus died on the cross. 
He was buried in the grave, and three days later, he rose up out of the grave. And when somebody is baptized, this is exactly how it happens, right? That you are laid down into the water, you are buried. You are, the, the word for baptism in the Greek or in the New Testament is called baptismo, which means to dunk or to immerse. It means completely under the water, right? It doesn't mean sprinkle. It means completely under the water. This is a picture of death, right? This is an example of not just Jesus' death, but your death, where you lay down your life. The old Mike is buried in the waters, and when you come back up out of the water, it is the new Mike. It is the new creation, right? You are born again, and that's what this passage is talking about, right? And in that moment, we, ex- we get to experience what it means to be one with Christ. Why? Well, let me just say this. There's nothing magical or mystical about what takes place in that baptistry, right? It's just the city of Ames tap water, right? There's nothing fancy about it. But you know what it is? It's your faith in what Jesus did for you on the cross. So you're saved by faith, right? And this example of your relationship with Jesus through baptism is what we see and is so important for us to make sure that if you've never been baptized, let me just challenge you to do that. And I know maybe some of you are thinking, well, you know, Mike, I was sprinkled when I was an infant. But the truth of it is, is that your mom and dad made that decision. You did not. Right? For most of us here that, and, you know, I I always talk about North Grand as having about 80% people who are sprinkled as babies, right? I don't know if you guys realize that, but probably 80% of this congregation was sprinkled when they were babies, right? And they begin to read the Bible and they begin to understand that baptism in the New Testament in the Greek means to immerse, it means to dunk, it means to go completely under. Why? Because it's this picture of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And, and Jesus calls us Jesus himself was baptized this way. If you remember John the Baptist and how John baptized Jesus in the water and Jesus came up out of the water and the spirit descended on Jesus like a dove. You remember that? You can read about it in the Gospels, right? And it's the same expression for us as well. That when we are baptized into Christ, right, it's this being baptized into his death. I had a little dog. I'll just share this with you. I had a little dog named Sumo one day when I was a kid and he got ran over by a car. It's a sad day when you live in the country and you let your dog run and do whatever they want. And I can't tell you how many dogs got ran over by cars, but Sumo was a precious little dog. And so we had this little service. We had it up uh, a place where we buried our pets up on the hill. And we would take and we would, we just laid Sumo on the ground. And we took a little bit of dirt and we sprinkled on top of him and called him good. No, that wasn't how you do it, right? You dig a hole, right? You dig a hole down into the ground and you laid his precious little body down in that hole and then you covered him completely up. That is what it means to be buried. That is what it means to die and be put. And that's what baptism is. You go completely under and come back up. So for those of you who have been sprinkled and you've never been immersed in the Christ, I want to challenge you this morning to be obedient to God's word. To be obedient. And, and let me just say this. And this, I think, is so important. You are not forsaking the guidance of your mom and dad. I, I oftentimes talk with people about this, and they're like, well, you know, if I, if I go ahead and get baptized by immersion, it's like I'm, I'm forsaking how my mom and dad wanted me to raise. No, if anything, you are laying on top of that foundation that they started in you, right? You're going back to what the Bible says to do, and you're trying to obey God's word and i want to challenge you this morning to do just that to obey god's word so this morning if you need to make a decision for christ i'm we're going to sing one more song before we close out the service and before we move on outside for the easter egg hunt i'm going to be sitting right back there on the back wall and if you need to make a decision for christ or you need to talk to somebody i will be back there and I'd be more than happy to talk with you. I'd love to be able to help you in any way that I can, right? So if, you, if you're ready to make a decision for Christ, if you're ready to be baptized, if you're ready to experience what it means to be born again, that's what Jesus was trying to drive home to Nicodemus, that he needs to come clean, that even though 
this idea that, that Nicodemus was a religious person. He wore a really good suit coat. <laughs> and yet his heart was miles and miles from God. As we leave today, let us not leave this building with our hearts being miles and miles from God. What we see in the New Testament is that those who did uh, were obedient to God and were baptized, that their lives changed. Right? We read about it in the book of Acts and what they did and how their lives were changed. You know what they did? We actually read about it on the, on the resurrection day. You remember the first people that came to the empty tomb? Do you remember who they were? They were ladies, right? They were, they were females. They came to the tomb and they saw the tomb was empty. And you know what they did? The angel spoke to them and said, hey, go tell. And that's exactly what they went and did. They went and told people about the good news that Jesus has risen from the grave. And so for us who have accepted Christ and for us who, you know, are, are striving to live a life that pleases God, that's our call. That's what we are to do. We are to go and to share the good news about Jesus' resurrection. Why? Because it's hope. It's hope for, for whatever situation that people are in in their life. It fits. It's a one size fit all, right? But here's the thing. Not everybody can get into the kingdom of God. It's exclusive. You can only come through Jesus. You can't get in in any other way. And we've been given the responsibility as well as the privilege and the opportunity to share the good news with others. And I pray that that was what we would do on this Easter day. Maybe you're spending time with family. Maybe you're spending time with friends. Maybe you know people who are far from from following Jesus or they don't have a church home or maybe they're struggling in their faith, share the hope of what Jesus brings. Easter is a special time of the year for us who are followers of Christ. May we share that hope, not just today, but the days ahead. So this morning I'm going to pray and then uh, Alberto and the team is going to come up and they're going to lead us in a time of worship. If you need to make a decision today, come and see me. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for Jesus' resurrection. Father, I thank you so much for the conversation that Jesus had with, with Nicodemus. Father, how he saw what Nicodemus needed in his life. He saw how far he was from God. That Nicodemus needed to be born again, born anew, to have this relationship with you. God, now I pray as we think about the, the steps for us to do that, how we have to believe and Father, how we have to confess, how we have to take off the suit jacket, Father, and stop hiding, stop pretending, but be who we really are before you, God, because that's the only way you're going to take us anyway, Father, that we be honest with where we're at with you, that we confess that we are lost and that we are dead and we need life, and it's only Jesus who brings that life. And I pray, Father, that as we think about this idea of repentance and about stop living for ourselves and start living for Jesus and this, this call to baptism, Father. That if our hearts would yield to you, Father, that, that maybe for some of us in this room this morning, Lord, that we need to be baptized. And I pray that we wouldn't walk out, oh, so it's, it would be so easy for us, Father, to walk out of this room this morning knowing that we need to be baptized and we don't do it. It would be so easy for us to just turn a deaf ear to your Holy Spirit I pray, Father, we wouldn't do that. I pray, Father, that we would yield our lives to you today, that we would be born again, born anew in Christ. And I pray, Father, for the rest of us, Lord, that we would share this hope with others, just like the ladies who ran from the tomb to tell the disciples, Father, that Jesus has risen from the dead. I pray that, Father, we would do just the same thing, that we would run and tell the good news that Jesus is alive, that he is risen. Father, we thank you for this, and we pray this all in Jesus' name.